where is the implication of democracy yes. and romanticism? Yes, and uh, if it's not Nietzsche, uh, again to return to our discussion of Napoleon, he he would be uh, an embodiment of the the leader turned dictator who has sought to you know rewrite the map of Europe uh, in his own lifetime, extending the French Empire, which itself has grown out of... And the against revolution. outrageous odds, it has to be said. Yeah, that, that's that, part of his... That's right. Persona. Uh, and the only thing that stops him from uh, uh, taking over Russia is you know, the harsh Russian winter of 1812. Tchaikovsky celebrates the defeat of Napoleon by including all those cannons in the 1812 overture. Um... But George is un, un, underlining for us this uh, central ambiguity in terms of romanticism as an ideology, if that's what it is. Anything as complex as this romantic movement from the turn of the 19th century is going to have its left wing and its right wing, its libertarian dimension and its potential for uh, tyranny. Um, it comes to the surface in the present day uh, we were speaking earlier about uh, the connections that are made between Ozymandias, uh, sometimes cited in the same breath as it were with images of Hosni uh, Mubarak in what is increasingly now referred to as the Egyptian Revolution. Um, you can see that image of a, a statue like Hosni Mubarak, who was a, a latter-day Ozymandias figure, Underneath that statue, you've got individual in Egyptian protesters waving the Egyptian flag. And I think it's in that conjunction of the stony-faced dictator, the Egyptian protester who claims to be renewing Egypt as a country, that embodies the two sides of our latter-day romanticism. Um, I'd like to say just uh, just something that's just sprung to me now. It's quite interesting to note uh, how you use the phrase the potential for tyranny that comes out of a... Uh, because everything about the uh, Romanticism, especially the French Revolution, implied a kind of uprising of power of the uh, people, much uh, much like Prometheus tried to give power to the people by taking the taking the fire away. And I think it's quite interesting to note, uh, sort of to bring in the modern day reference of things that are going on in the middle of this moment, that uh, Colonel Gaddafi of Libya came out of... Uh, well, became head of that country through a military coup with his kind of a uh, key thing was a power to the people. And I think it's quite interesting you brought that up with that potential for tyranny with quite a revolutionary, uh, the way he came into power was quite revolutionary, uh, quite similar to the French Revolution in that sort of idea. I think that's an interesting point. I mean, if it, Mubarak's interesting, but I think Colonel Gaddafi is much more of a kind of Ozymandias type figure of, of complete egomania that he... He rewrote. He wrote this green book, didn't he? It's a completely new philosophy for the world. Huge mm. statues of himself, absolutely everywhere. Mm. Teams of people hired to glorify him all the time. We mentioned Ozymandias in passing, but can can you pick up those themes as well? You know, there are other romantic texts we can reach for that articulate a commentary on these current events. Um, I'm sort of looking out for cross references. Maybe not necessarily to Ozymandias in connection with uh, Colonel Gaddafi, but uh, that other famous romantic poem, Kubla Khan, seems to offer a, an equally apt commentary on the story of what's looking like the rise and fall of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, particularly those images in that Coleridge fragment to do with uh, the, the wild, the wild hair. <laughs> Um, that kind of uh, figure who, who is self-possessed with their own genius and the, the Coleridge fragment winds up with a warning why weave a circle round him thrice for he on honeydew hath fed as though you know, these, these uh, charismatic leaders can lead you in uh, a positive direction and just as easily uh, bound you up with the, the story of their own downfall. Mm. Felicity? 
Okay, so my question was how the uh, definition of romantic has shifted, you know, it seems to have dropped all its negative connotations. Yes. And today it's just used in like, the context of like, romantic love. Yes. I just wondered how that happened over the period of the last 200 years. Yes, it is a remarkable semantic shift over that 200 year period. And curiously enough, if we had the likes of Shelley and Coleridge and Lord Byron sitting around this desk with us this afternoon, and we were to tell them, you know, your romantics, you know, they'll be very surprised because it's a re retrospective label that we apply to this period of cultural history. Uh, and they might even be really quite offended if we were to try to tell them that they were romantics um, because they would recognise what I suppose is the difference between romantic with a capital R and romantic with a, a lowercase r. The lowercase romantic someone who is light and fanciful and dreaming and that might well apply to Shelley and company but then the more serious official romantic with the uppercase R is the one that tends to be more commonplace in academic discussion and is probably articulated closer to these notions of politics and democracy the kinds of things that we've been talking about with with an undercurrent of uh, Shelley or Lord Byron being famous love poets. Um, whenever they write poetry, arguably it's for strongly political reasons. Uh, and that other notion of love that is associated with verses in Valentine's cards is not quite the same kind of poetry that Lord Byron writes, for example. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Great. Um, now, in the lecture, you, you contrasted uh, the Romantic period, uh, as it's known to academics, just a convenient category, with a preceding period which you called the Age of Reason or the Enlightenment. Could you explore that a bit more? I mean, what, what's the difference? What's, what suddenly happens around 1900 and everybody stops looking for universal laws and stops, uh, you know, writing cynical, snide plays about people and decide to get inside, as it were, with their feminine side, you know, emoting, emotional, love, etc., etc. Yeah. What, what, what was underlying that shift, do you yes, think? Yes, yes. Perhaps the easiest if way... If it's a valid shift at all. If, if it is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of revisionism very recently, which questions the so-called continuity, uh, sorry, the, the, the rupture of... Uh, uh, the Enlightenment, which is uh, discontinued into the Romantic era, and the uh, body of opinion is shifting more into the direction of arguing for an essential continuity. Um, but for what it's worth, there's a standard argument that uh, the point that marks the differentiation is precisely Immanuel Kant, whom we were referring to earlier, with his uh, piece of journalism from 1794 uh, an essay called What is Enlightenment Decem published in, in a periodical December uh, into January 1794 itself a kind of media event and he's tapping into a, an ongoing discussion of the day what is this thing called enlightenment and the way that Kant talks about it uh, is done in such a way that he's offering comment on what we've been living through for the Just past... Just to that this is all really part of the ferment around the French Revolution. So yes. Kant is writing about the same time as the French Revolution. Yes, yes. Um, uh, the, the revolution gives rise to this kind of debate. Uh, it's, it's supremely uh, an exercise in, in free thinking, speculation. Uh, rehearsing these ideas about democracy, society, universal art, rights, universal rights. Kant himself gives a rather oblique question to uh, uh, a rather oblique answer to this question: What is enlightenment? In a phrase, he says, "Sapere orde," the, 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 the Latin epigram, which means "dare to know," which captures that dimension in enlightenment thought and activity.